Okay, welcome back. This is my second lecture on California politics. This one is titled The Rules That Matter because we're focusing specifically on the rules of California system of government and how that affects how politicians behave, right? Remember one of our main things, our main theory families in uh, political science is what we call rational actor theories and they uh, focus on using rules to explain why politicians do what they do. So remember, rules matter. The key thing I want you to remember in this lecture is we're linking electoral rules, the rules of our government, with how politicians behave. And California has undergone some big changes in the last eight years, so I'm going to run us down through those changes and show how they've affected who's getting elected, how they get elected, how they behave when they're in state government, etc. You saw a similar version of this in the last one. You probably want to take notes on this slide uh, because this is there's a lot of action here and I'm going to be going through all of these different things uh, as I go. So first, Citizens Redistricting Commission. No more gerrymandering. I'm going to talk about this. Second, the Opener Jungle Primary. Changed how we do our primary elections. Third, changed the majority budget. So it used to be you needed a two-thirds majority to pass the budget in California. Now it's just a simple majority. And then fourth, we revised term limits. First passed in 1990, revised in 2012, okay? Note, it's important to remember the two-thirds for new taxes, which comes from Prop 13, is different from the two-thirds budget. And California is the only, used to be, was the only state with both two-third tax and two-third budget rule. Okay, let's look at our first two rules, but to do that I need to talk about this important piece of political science we call the Median Voter Theorem. The Median Voter Theorem is a central piece of rational actor explanations of political science, okay? It's not perfect, I'm not going to really worry about the criticisms that much, but it explains a whole lot, and I'll put some supplementary materials up on Canvas so you can get a little bit deeper into the Median Voter Theorem. But I want you to learn it just like I teach it here in this class today, okay? Median, median, if you remember from your high school math, median means the middle, middle person, and in this case, the middle voter, okay? So if you line all your voters up on a left-right scale, the median will be usually sort of right in the middle, middle. The Median Voter Theorem states that politicians will take positions and run their campaigns in order to get a majority of votes. The median voter is the guy who will put you over the top. So electoral competition is driving politicians to try to get a majority. You got to get a majority to win. So you will change your behavior in order to appeal to that median voter. Okay? So basically politicians will say anything to get elected, but it's anything that the median voter wants, that they think the median voter wants. So that's where they're sort of trying to go. So let's think very simply. This is not even dealing with California yet. This is just a basic introduction to the median voter theorem. In a general election, when most voters are moderate, the median voter theorem will cause politicians to come to the middle. It looks like this, right? So you have left, right, median voter, and candidates are going to come to the middle. The median voter theorem in a primary election, right? So remember, in regular primary elections, they're run by the parties. You have two. You have here's Clinton versus Sanders. Here is uh, Trump versus all those other guys, right? So it's two different elections, actually. It causes candidates to go to the outside, to become more extreme, okay? Because primary elections are dom dominated by people who are more partisan than the general election. So people talked about this, Hillary Clinton going out to the left. What this explains. So, so far what I've said applies pretty much to any election in the United States and many worldwide, not every single, because there's some differences later we'll get into to how people vote that sort of affect this story. But for the time being, this can pretty much apply to, this applies pretty much to most elections, okay? Um, and it explains a lot of important stuff for us. It explains why candidates go to the outside of the political spectrum in the primaries and then turn around and come back to the middle in the general election. The median, the, the median voter in the primary is further outside, so they go there. In the general, he's usually right in the middle, so they end up in the middle. This also applies to federal and state elections. 
And there's a funny link here. Go watch this link. Um, it's a Saturday Night Live skit of Hillary Clinton changing her positions to appeal to primary voters. It's pretty funny. Okay, now let's think about our first rule. Remember the first rule said no more gerrymandering. What is gerrymandering? First, gerrymandering is drawing electoral districts to favor an ethnic group or political party. Or anybody, any type of favoring way of drawing a, 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 a district. From, it comes from Massachusetts Governor Eldridge Jerry. He drew a district that looked like a salamander, so it became gerrymandering. Very negative connotations, kind of trying to manipulate the rules of the game to get electoral advantage. Now, what was happening in California was this. We drew districts to favor incumbents, whether Democratic or Republican. Okay, so that's incumbents, whether Democratic or Republican. So whether you're a Democratic or Republican, you had a large registration advantage, right? You had more people who agreed with you in your district. Okay, so let's think about this. Median voter theorem stipulate, stipulates that candidates will take positions or position take in order to reach an electoral majority. Notice how you need a pretty good balance between Democrats and Republicans for moderation to happen. In gerrymandered districts, the median voter is pushed further le left and further right due to the registration advantage. This would be a gerrymandered district in favor of a Republican. Notice very few Democrats, very few small, small me member of people in the middle, and then a big bump here. And so your median voter is going to end up being sort of right around here somewhere. So a Republican's definitely going to win, but it's also going to affect their behavior in other ways. Notice, if you didn't have to appeal to the other side to get reelected, would you be more moderate or more extreme? Well, the answer is you'd be more extreme, right? You're a Republican. If you don't have to appeal to Democrats to get reelected, you are not going to, and vice versa. Democrats, you know, if you have a gerrymandered district in favor of Democrats, they're going to be as far, far to the left as they can go. Maybe not all the way to the left, right, but it's further left. So gerrymandering caused a lot of partisan gridlock in California. Okay, so California state government used to be completely gridlocked. But this changed. Citizens Redistricting Commission in 2010 previously pointed it out. What did it do? It mandated more competitive districts. There are some limits to that. Um, so you're not allowed to break up ethnic groups arbitrarily, things like that, because gerrymandering through the 1960s was used to reduce the power of African Americans and other ethnic groups. So you're not allowed to gerrymander them out of having uh, electoral power. But working within some of those other federal limits, the Citizens Redistricting Commission mandates that uh, um, more competitive districts be drawn. And it definitely led to more compromise in the state legislature. It has strongly affected political behavior. Candidates are distinctly more moderate now. It's not the only reason why, however. So the median voter theorem also helps us think about our second rule, the open primary. Top two or jungle primary actually is what, I, what it's properly called. One of the most important and different rules from anywhere else in the nation is the new top two primary system. What this means is that the top two vote earners in the primary go to the general. So you could have two Democrats or two Republicans or one of each. Notice normally it's a Democrat and a Republican period, done. Here, everyone goes, you all run together in one big first primary, and then the top two vote getters go into the general election. So happens a lot with two Democrats. Happens actually not infrequently with two Republicans as well. And you know, you still get a lot of one, one, you know, one Democrat, one Republican. This strongly affects who gets elected both in the primary and the general election. So let's, let me do a quick contrast between the regular primary and the top two. In the old rule, just like the presidential primary, because this rule does not apply to the presidential primary, only to California state offices, parties do primaries, right? So there's some variation here of who they allow vote and stuff like that, but basically you end up with one Democrat versus one Republican, okay? The top two primary is one big primary to rule them all, 
right? I like the Lord of the Ring jokes, even though I don't even like the movie, but you know, one primary to rule them all. The top two vote earners go on to the general and two Democrats or two Republicans happens a lot. So let's look at the median voter theorem and primary elections, the top two. Usually in primaries, candidates go to the outside to appeal to the party base, right? Remember that's this one, right? Guys are going to the outside. But in our current situation, all the votes get thrown in together and there are frequently five to seven or more candidates competing. So this really affects how they behave. I had to hand draw this because I couldn't find it, you know, couldn't find someone who's actually done it, which makes me think I should publish an article doing this, um, but I only have so much time in my life. The median voter theorem in the top two primary. This is what I call the game of sit and knockout. Why? First, each candidate, here I've done five candidates, they're all gonna try to capture, sort of sit, on one part of the political spectrum. So, you know, I'm, my far, I'm a far lefty, I'm a sort of moderate Dem, I'm right in the middle, I'm a moderate Republican, and I'm far to the right Republican. So they're each gonna try to capture this little element of the spectrum, okay? So rather than running out or there, they're kind of saying, well, where's a base that I can kind of sit down on, okay? But then, in order to be competitive, you can't just sit there, you have to try to knock out rivals, right? Knock out rivals that you think will be dangerous in the general election, okay? So, you know, uh, if you're B, you're gonna probably try to knock out C. So you might, you know, you're gonna target specific people in the primary, trying to get them knocked out. So you might, you know, run some negative campaigns against C, trying to get him down, because you're afraid of C. Or, you might try to get another candidate to run who's got exactly the same policies as candidate C. Then we would have two candidates right here sitting on the same part of the spectrum. Well, if you have two candidates just overlapped on top of each other, what's gonna happen? Split the votes, right? So the game in the primary has become very sort of cloak and dagger almost because you have so many candidates, it's very chaotic, and there's a lot of action just on trying to manipulate who's running and what type of people they are able to apply to, right? If you're candidate C, you really want to run against either A or E, right? Because you're going to have a huge advantage against them. Why is that the case? Well, let's look at the median voter theorem and general elections under a top two system. If there are two candidates of the same party, then there is a huge advantage to the more moderate candidate. So it doesn't matter whether this is Democrat or Republican. So we used to, we were doing this, we did the primary, we ended up with this. You have a lefty Dem and you have a moderate Dem. Who wins? Question, who wins? The answer, B wins. Almost every time, because he will get all of the Republican votes. So B sitting here, he's a moderate Dem. He's right here in this happy space. A actually has a little bit more coverage, but what about all these guys? There's no one who's appealing to them. Are they gonna pick A or B? Well, they're gonna pick B, right? You know, your moderate Dem isn't gonna raise taxes as much, etc. Republicans are gonna pick the moderate, and same vice versa, okay? So we now have four, four different ways of thinking how the median voter theorem affects elections. We did a regular general, a regular primary, then I did the top two primary, and then I did uh, the top two uh, in the general. Top two, so what happens if you have two candidates of the same party? Okay, so notice how this one piece of political science, I was able to take it through and apply it to a lot of different scenarios and situations, and each of those different scenarios and situations sort of is riffing off of this same idea. So let's add it up a little bit to sort of see how it's affected California today. Gerrymandered districts pre-2010 were a huge problem leading to partisan gridlock. There's little doubt about this. I feel very comfortable saying that as a political scientist. Today, interestingly, some people think we've gone too far towards the middle. Uh, the moderate Democrats or mods, as they call them up in the state capitol, have a lot of power now. Um, there's no doubt about this. Things are better than they were. We will see if this new political configuration will be able to address the issues I talked about in my last lecture. 
but they have a better chance than what was happening before. Moderation, just let me leave you with this thought. Moderation, I'm a pretty moderate guy. Moderation's good, but you know, all things in moderation, including moderation. Just because you're in the middle doesn't mean you're right, okay? And you know, sometimes we need people who are partisan and you know, more on the extremes, who really dig into their positions. Um, but at least California definitely had too much of that before. Maybe we've overcorrected towards the middle. I don't know, time will tell, but all things in moderation, including moderation. This rule change is maybe the most important of all of them, okay? Our budget rule. The old rule was two thirds vote to pass the yearly budget. Makes it really hard to pass a budget. Notice, in this situation, Republicans might not have had an actual majority in the Senate or House of uh, Assembly, but they almost always had more than one third of the votes, okay? What did this mean? It was a kind of minority party veto over the state budget. And this is what would happen. Imagine it's 2010, 29, big budget deficit. And Democrats who have the majority, they put together a budget proposal and it's a lot of cuts, about 80% cuts and about 20% revenue. They go to Republicans and say, hey, Republicans, what do you think about this? Republicans say, no, thank you. We prefer cuts only. No new revenue, right? Republicans is a principled thing for a lot of Republicans, at least no new taxes. So they say no, and you have to get their votes in order to pass it. Democrats say, well, look, we're the majority, and this is more than fair. We gave you 80% cuts, 20% revenue, and you're rejecting it. And Republicans say, you're right, we're rejecting it. We have a principled opposition to taxes and you need our votes. So what do Democrats say? Please, right? And you're at loggerheads here, right? And one of the consequences of this was late budgets, especially in years with budget deficits, right? If you have extra money, it's not so much of a problem, but if you have to cut or raise taxes, it's a big, big, big problem. Now, the second thing that would happen is if Democrats say, we're not gonna only do cuts and Republicans say no new revenue, what's your option there to close the state budget gap? Well, borrowing, the proverbial credit card, okay? So through the entire 2000s, California was borrowing sometimes 10, 15% of its yearly revenue. That's too high, okay? Now, I'll just tell you, the professor of political science, all governments borrow at least a little bit 99% of the time. I mean, there are some exceptions. It's not like every year we're always borrowing a little bit. Sometimes you run surpluses, etc. But governments tend, if government runs a one, two, three, four percent deficit in a year, that's not a big problem, okay? On the other hand, if you're running 10% deficits each year for a long time, that is a problem and it, you will overborrow. <clears throat> so this is a great example of the political dysfunction that reigned in California through the 2000s. So in 2010, Prop 25 switched it, just regular majority budget, right? Majority rules, right? You say that on the playground when you're playing uh, handball, stuff like that, four square, tetherball, whatever kind of game you play as a kid, right? Majority rules, someone tries to cut in line and you don't want to play with them, you say, no, majority rules, we all voted, you have to wait in line. You know, it's not nice to do this. Prop 25 definitely cut Republicans out of budgetary decisions, not entirely, um, but largely, okay? Um, but it made it easier to get budget dones, done. It helps that the economy is better too. Okay, let's just talk a little bit about California's legislature. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of information on just how our legislature works. It's pretty similar to the federal system, um, but a little bit different. And then I'm gonna talk about term limits and get into some other things. Just like the federal system, we have the Senate and the Assembly. So, you know, Senate equals Senate. The Assembly in California is like the House of Representatives. We have 40 members in the Senate and 80 in the Assembly. Bills are labeled by where they begin. So if you ever see SB, you know, if you see this in the news, SB, that's Senate bill, AB is assembly bill, okay? So they're labeled by where they begin. 
any bill that's going to have a high budgetary cost, and this is up to the people who are running the Senate themselves, gets put into what's called the suspense file. And it only comes out of there at the very end of the year when we're, we take, kind of we pass a whole bunch of bills and then we kind of go back and we look at them and like, well, we only have X amount of money. Which of these are we really willing to spend money on? So California actually spent basically, mostly, we put a bunch of things in to be done. And then at the end, we only pull some of them out. Okay. Um, there's also such things that people call local bills or sometimes home bills. So it's something that my district cares about. So um, one of these bills, for example, up in Sonoma, they're having tr problems with people illegally cutting down trees, tree poachings. They wanted to increase the penalty on illegal cuttings. That's a local bill. Trees only found in this one area. The guy cares about it. It's his district. He, um, he tries to get that bill passed. Um, <clears throat> you know, you'd be surprised how much uh, the government's really doing. It's sometimes very detailed stuff. So, you know, I have a friend who works at the Capitol and she was talking about a bill she was working on where they're trying to replace school bus engines. Why? Okay, school bus engines are old, they're big polluters, and then it turns out that they're causing kids to have asthma problems because it's this awful exhaust the exhaust systems aren't that good. Exhaust is coming into the actual uh, school bus. And I remember being a kid even and taking uh, field trips, you know, almost have like a little headache afterwards because you're in inhaling fumes all day long. So it was bad for the kids. It was bad for the environment. And what they do, they threw some money at replacing school bus, school bus engines with cleaner uh, engines. Okay. Um, you know, uh, we'll come back to this question of is voting rational later, but this comes from, again, rational actor uh, models. Um, you know, just think about this. The fewer the number of people who vote, the more important your vote is. Vote in your local elections or you are wasting your vote, okay? Mm, don't worry about the rest of that stuff. Things legislators do. Community service and outreach executive branch oversight, pass laws. The big, the five most important players in the California state government are the governor, speaker of the assembly, the pro tem of the Senate, that's the leader of the Senate, the and the minority leader of each house. So the Republican minority leader, they actually get a lot of power as well. Don't worry about this last one. Let's talk about term limits. Originally passed in 1990, pre-1990, we had no term limits. The way it worked was eight years in the, in, uh, in, the, in the Senate, six years in the Assembly, and you could switch between the two. Okay, are term limits good or bad in general? You know, hard to say, but these ones were really, really short, and some of the consequences of term limits are this. You lose experience, okay? Maybe that's not a big deal, but you know, if you've had, you know, think about a job you've had, how long does it take you to get good at your job? It takes quite a number of years. Um, and here, you know, uh, these are really short term limits. I mean, in baseball, what if you had to, you know, switch to the American League after six years and then after 14 years, you're just out? Well, you know, a lot of baseball players play for more than 14 years. And the only reason why they stop is because their body starts to break down. Theoretically, if their body didn't break down, they would be even better, you know, longer. So very, very, very short term limits. The second thing that happens here is what we call the musical chair of politics. Once you were elected, you were always looking for that next position you had to get into because you couldn't stay where you're at very long. You had to leave. So just like the childhood game, kind of musical chair of politics, you know, the song sings and you run around the chairs trying to find a new job. Okay. One of the good things about term limits, new blood, new people, do you get new ideas? I put a question mark there because I've been in politics a long time. I don't see new ideas all that frequently. <laughs> so it's like, you know, we bring in new people, but do they really have that much new ideas? Okay, we have a new Democrat, and what does he say? Raise taxes, and we have a new Republican, what does he say? Cut taxes. Okay, thanks guys. Um, definitely leads to more competition for seats though, and that may be good or bad. One of the big things it did was it increased the uh, power of interest groups and bureaucrats. Why? 
Well, if you're only in your job for eight, maybe six years, it takes a long time to get good. When you get started, who knows what's going on? Well, the legislators and the bureaucrats are the ones who know what's going on. So the politicians get elected, you know, they, they, they come to their office in Sacramento, and then the bureaucrats just walk in and they say, look, here's how you need to do your job, right? Um, which leads to more power for them. And then also it increased the power of the governor and the executive branch. Reformed our term limits in 2012. Now you can do 12 years no matter where you're elected. Okay, that's a good difference. The consequences of that, you lose less experience, but you still get uh, new blood, so that's nice. You reduce the musical chair, chair effect. It's changed competition in some other small ways, um, but overall this is definitely a positive change. At least that's my rating of this. You keep the good of term limits and you reduce the bad, right? So these term limits were incredibly short. You know, on the face of it, there's nothing wrong about term limits. But boy, these were really short and, you know, a lot of power for bureaucrats. Lots of musical chairs, right? All that kind of stuff. The, these longer term limits, people are staying in their offices a bit longer. You still get new blood, but it's reducing the power of lobbyists, etc., and even the executive branch. So those are the changes. Now I'm just going to talk a little bit more about some of the other parts of California's government. This isn't quite as terribly important, but it's important for you to know about. California has what we call a plural executive. That means that there's a bunch of independently elected people who each have a sort of share of executive power. So we have eight total executive officers plus the Board of Equalization that does taxes, sort of helps. Um, they're like accountants who, they don't only pass tax law, but they check and see are people doing it, and you know, they're involved in taxes very strongly. Um, but the problem is agencies frequently end up serving different masters. They have a bunch of bosses, and then your bosses get into fights over territory, right? So, and there's no you know, central mechanism to help them coordinate. There's no, you know, if you're watching Game of Thrones, they have the small council, and everybody comes, and you talk through your issues in the small council. You know, there's nothing like that, nothing equivalent in California. Or if it was a business, you would just have a board of directors meeting, right? And you have the CFO, the CEO, da 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 da, -da. Everyone's there, they talk through their problems. California doesn't have that. Everyone's just out there doing their own thing. I was elected, I'm gonna do what I wanna do. The governor's obviously the most important. He's the head of state and the chief executive. He has a lot of power in setting uh, policy priorities what we call agenda setting, and he gets to enforce his priorities legislatively with the veto. So, you know, currently it's Jerry Brown. If the, uh, if the um, Democrats in the legislature aren't doing what he wants, he gets to say, well, I'm not going to do what you want and hold them accountable with his veto. So he'll just start vetoing everything that they want until they start doing some of the things that he wants. Just like the president at the federal level, we have executive order, which is his right to pass bureaucratic rules and regulations that affect only the state bureaucracy. Governor can also call special legislative, legislative sessions and special elections. Arnold Schwarzenegger called several special elections. He didn't have a lot of success at getting his policy priorities passed there, but he did it. Uh, in California, we also have the line item veto, which allows the governor to only veto parts of a bill, especially budgetary fat. Like if he thinks some just unnecessary spending, he can cut it. He has to be careful about doing that though, because if he starts line item vetoing things and the, the legislature doesn't like it, they'll just stop passing him stuff to veto and then nothing will get done, right? He also submits the budget proposal and he's the commander in chief as well, National Guard. This is the list of executives. It's pretty long. <laughs> Superintendent of Public Instruction, Insurance Commissioner, you know, standardizes the taxes, and Treasurer, Controller, Secretary of State, Attorney General. Attorney General is important. Secretary of State's important. Um, Board of Equalization is important. Insurance Commissioner has power decent amount of power in its limited realm. Same with the superintendent of public instruction. 
Lieutenant governor is largely ceremonial, but if the governor dies or is incapacitated, you get to be governor. Consequences. Well, there's a splintering of authority, right? More people get involved, but it also reduces accountability. Who's really in charge? Everyone's fighting over, you know, everyone's fighting over uh, territory and stuff like that. Secondly, it li limits the governor's power. It makes, you know, the main governor hard for him to agenda set and get things done. Okay. Very important. This is a hugely, hugely important part of California's system of governance, okay? Very important. Direct democracy. What direct democracy is, is we vote directly as citizens on laws. Prop 13, Prop 187, you've seen a lot of these already. My list of changes, all of those changes happened through the direct democracy system, okay? There are three kinds of of direct democracy, initiative, referendum, and recall. Let's start with recall, because we're not going to talk about it as much. Recall is if there's someone in office and you don't like them, you gather a bunch of signatures and they have to actually run again for the position that they're currently into in, in right now. So you don't wait another two or three years till the regular election's coming up. We gather a bunch of signatures and then Gray Davis has to go defend himself in an election. Referendum is well, what if the California state legislature passes something that we don't like? So a law has been passed by the government, we don't like it, now, well, now what do we do? Gather signatures, and then it's up for the laws on suspense until, it's, 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 um, going, until we vote on it in an actual election. Currently, the, there's a plastic ban referendum that we'll be voting on in November. Most important one, and where I'm going to focus, is the initiative system. That's where citizens get to propose laws themselves. So you come up with an idea for a law, you gather signatures, it gets put on the ballot, and then we vote yes or no on that law. Frequently called the fourth branch because of how often it is used. So there are four stages to the initiative system, okay? Um, um, there's some differences here. Legal statute versus constitutional amendment. A legal statute is a regulatory law change. A constitutional amendment actually amends the California state constitution. Direct versus indirect initiative. Direct is um, the people themselves do it. Indirect is sometimes the legislature wants us to vote on something, so then they put it on the ballot for us, okay? From 1979, sorry, that shouldn't have a one there, from 1979 to 2012, 195 initiatives were put on the ballot. That's a lot, okay. Four stages to uh, initiative system. Stage one, preparation. You write and submit to the Secretary of State your proposed new law. Stage two, you signature gather. Um, it costs about three million to pay to pay signature gatherers. So most of them are paid and they earn about two to four dollars per signature. The number of signatures you need is five percent for legal statute, eight percent for a constitutional amendment from the last general election. This year the numbers are 504,000 or 807,000 signatures. Stage three you go to the election and then stage four you implement it if passed. So there's some good, some bad, and some ugly when we're talking about the initiative system. Let's start with the good. Well, you get to go around the stinking politicians, right? Prop 215, medicinal marijuana. California was the first state in the nation to have medicinal marijuana, and it would have never happened if not for the initiative system, okay? Go around the stinking politicians. Another good one. You know, because of this, it allows innovation, right? So California was innovative in this sense. We wanted it, we gave it to ourselves, that's good. You know, the other good thing is, well, people get what they want, right? It feels really legitimate. We voted on it, you win, you lose, you know, whatever it is, but you get what you want. At least the majority does. Let's talk about the bad. Um, the one I'm most concerned about uh, here is actually this first one, the, what I call the lock-in effect. And what does that mean? Well, we make really big changes and then we don't think about the long-term consequences. If we, and then 
if we make a mistake and we need to fix it, we have to, we have to go back to the ballot box, meaning it's a bunch of work. Term limits, right? Remember my term limit lecture I just finished. We passed these term limits. They were really short, caused a bunch of problems. It took 22 years to get those term limits changed. And we tried to change them one time and failed and had to go back and try again. <sighs> I'm tired just thinking about it, right? I mean, this is, this is something else, okay? So the lock-in effect. We lock in big changes and then it's hard to change them. Okay, common, common you know, claim here, a tool of the special interest. You know, maybe. People really like to say that, that the initiative system is a tool of the special interest. Special interests definitely do blast money at the initiative process and pretty fre frequently win. But they tend to do better at fighting off attacks on their interests than pushing their own agendas. Okay, So if you're a business, you're better at defeating a tax increase than you are at putting a tax decrease on there and winning, right? Same things for unions. So they're more, they do a better job at defending their territory through the initiative system against initiatives that are against their interests and not as good of a job at actually pushing through things that are in their interests and against other people's, okay? There is a lot of money in it, however. I mean, look at the book. There's a lot of money in it. Another bad thing, definitely not as bad as some of these other ones, the lock-in effect, not as bad as that, but we do a lot of budgeting at the ballot box. What do I mean by that? Well, every time we pass a new initiative, it usually carves out some general fund dollars for a special project. So we have our general fund pool of money and the legislature gets to each year say, here, 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 here. But then initiative comes along and they say, okay, we're gonna take some money from that general fund and we're going to say you can only spend that money on this thing that the initiative really cares about. It might be sports programs, Arnold Schwarzenegger. It might be uh, pre-K education, Rob Reiner, right? That's one lefty, one righty example. But carving out money from the general fund to give to your pet project, that's actually a problem because when the economy gets bad and we have to figure out, have really prioritized, it's really hard to touch these special revenue streams. Okay, um, bad. Another one, bargaining at the ballot box. So a couple years back, California was gonna put a state sales tax on internet purchases, right? Very reasonable thing, right? You go to Target, you have to pay state sales tax. Why wouldn't you pay state sales tax on Amazon? But you know, Amazon doesn't like it. So Amazon says, look, we don't like this. And what do they do? They start gathering signatures and they say, we're gonna put this on the ballot in November and you're gonna to have to go you know, waste your time and money campaigning against us. In this case, what happened was Amazon was able to extract a two year um, hiatus on when the tax would go into effect. So Amazon didn't win, the government didn't win. It was bargaining at the ballot box. Amazon uses the threat of an initiative in order to get a compromise from the California state legislature. And then something that's just annoying, and actually it's pretty annoying. <laughs> I've been here for a long time, I grew up in California, I'm starting to get annoyed. Multiple votes on the same thing, even though it loses. So, you know, anti-union stuff that almost every electoral cycle is up there you know, pay, so-called paycheck protection. Um, I'm just like, look, if you win, you win. If you don't, you don't. But voting on it, you know, every four years or sometimes even more frequently than that, it just gets a little ridiculous, right? So maybe there should be some kind of hiatus. If you lose, you got to wait 10 years before you try again, something like that. You know, same for parental notification for minors who need to terminate a pregnancy. That gets put up there over and over and over again. You know, it's really controversial. Uh, Planned Parenthood and the National Organization of Women have to spend a lot of money on it, but it's up there again. Every three or four years, we're voting on this stuff and other things as well, okay? Very annoying, right? Um, let's take an example, uh, let's see, the ugly. Let's do the ugly and then I'll do Prop 13 as an example of the lock-in effect. The ugly. Majority votes on minority rights. This makes me really nervous, right? 
there's very few checks and balances on the initiative system. Only the Supreme Court, after something's been passed, can overturn it, and that's the California, well, or federal Supreme Court could technically do that as well, okay? So Prop 8 was the anti-gay marriage initiative. That was overturned eventually by the courts. Prop 187 was also eventually overturned by the courts. Um, I think that's supposed to be Prop 207, okay? Um, all of these are majority votes on minority rights. And I just get really nervous when we're doing things like demonizing undocumented immigrants, things like that. Um, uh, you know, and then, you know, the whole point of checks and balances is to protect minority rights and to give minorities a voice in the government. That, that's just not there with the direct democracy system. You know, a small check from the Supreme Court, but no strong balancing, okay? There's not a lot of these majority votes on minority rights, but they're some of the ugliest cases we have. And interestingly, things like 187, when you have these racialized campaigns, they're actually shown to increase racial bias in the population. Because you get advertisements that are like, it's an invasion, or there, whoever they are, is getting something special that you're not getting. And then people start to feel more prejudice. It increases the racial prejudice because of the advertising campaigns, okay? And then ugly. This is very similar to the, the multiple votes thing I was talking about later, but there's just so many propositions. We vote on everything. We vote on the Delta tunnels, auto insurance rates, school, prison, marijuana, right? Do we have the time or capability as individual voters to understand all these issues, issues and make, make an educated judgment? And the answer is no, not even for professors of political science. Uh, look, Delta tunnels, we actually voted on that. I tried to read just, <laughs> I tried to read just the voter guide on the Delta tunnel thing, and I couldn't even make sense of it, right? And I'm highly, 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 highly educated. If I tried and failed, your average person doesn't have any hope, okay? So, you know, that's, that's an issue we really need to be thinking about. Um, you know, um, maybe we need to reduce the number of initiatives that are getting put onto the ballot. That would be a good idea. Let's look at um, an example of the lock-in effect that's also a really important part of California's government, which is Prop 13, okay? So this is just, you know, uh, my criticism here is more of the lock-in effect and less of Prop 13. I do think we should make some reasonable changes to Prop 13. Californians really like Prop 13, so just keep that in mind. Um, but, you know, here we go. Here's an example of what happened. Prop 13 did two things. Two-thirds vote for tax increase and change the property tax system. Memorize this. Uh, you don't need to memorize it. You need to know it for your paper. It switched from a market price to a purchase price system. This is what that means. Normally in most states, however much your house is worth today, you pay taxes on that value. So if your house goes up 10% in value, well, your tax goes up 10% in value too. House goes down, tax goes down, right? And each year they just check, how much is your house worth this year? Okay, here's your tax. Vast majority of states do that. A purchase price system is you pay taxes on how much your house was worth the year you purchased it. And the purchase price system looks like this. Your base value is 1% of the value of property in the year of purchase. And then you're only allowed, you only have a maximum 2% increase of the base, base value each year after that. Okay, what were the consequences of this change? First, there became a huge, huge difference in between people who've owned their home for a long time and new purchasers. Never sell property in California. Don't do it, just don't do it. You own property, keep it. Because the longer you have it, the lower your tax burden is in relationship to how much that house is actually worth. Second, very strong shift. The so second thing, very strong shift of California's tax base away from property taxes and toward income and sales tax. Third, it tangled state and local finances, creating an accountability problem. What used to happen is that all the property tax money went straight to cities and counties. 
Once Prop 13 came in, cities and counties had no money. And so the state did this. The state said, okay, we're going to give you money from state and income taxes to make up for the money you lost from property taxes. And then the state started collecting that property tax to themselves for the most part. What does that mean though? Well, who's really in charge? The state is giving money to the localities who are then spending it on things like education. Well, but if I have a problem with education, do I want to go to my locality who's spending the money or to the state who's the one who's actually raising the money and has a big say in what's happening as well? That's an accountability problem. We're not really sure whose authority where and it makes it hard to make changes. Fourth, a shift in California's property tax burden from businesses to individuals. It used to be roughly 60% was paid by businesses and 40% was paid by individuals, and now that's effectively reversed. Why? Businesses don't die, okay? If you sell your house to move to a new area to take a new job, your house will be revalued and the new buyer will pay a higher rate than you were. But businesses, well, they never die. They don't move to take a new job somewhere. They, if you were, say, Disneyland, which is one of my examples, and you, you've had your property literally forever, your property tax rate on that property is incredibly low. Disney pays five cents per square foot in property taxes. If you bought a house down the street in Anaheim today, it would, it's actually an old number, it would be more like $2.20 or $2.30 per square foot. Okay, that's a difference of over 40 times. What? <laughs> okay, all right. This is a joke, it's not really my retirement plan. I actually have it not great, but I'm you know, trying to save my, my, my money. Um, my parents bought their first house in LA in 1976. They paid $67,000. That should be a dollar sign. The base value is 670 dollars okay so that's their base value that's what they pay and then each year they get a two percent increase for each year which means their total pay now is around thirteen hundred dollars okay so two percent increase for 40 years they're now up to about thirteen hundred dollars how much do you think that house is worth today well my father says it's worth one million let's just lowball that and call it seven hundred and fifty thousand the base value just for this year would be $7,500. But my parents are paying $1,300, leading to a tax savings of about $6,000 a year. It's pretty good. That's why it's my retirement plan. Dad, just give me the house. <laughs> and then also, interestingly, this is just, you don't have to know this, but keep it in mind, there's lots of other sort of loopholes and exceptions in Prop 13. So you can pass, my parents can pass me their house and I get to keep that low property tax rate. If they pass it to me, a family member, it doesn't get revalued, it stays at that 1300 um, realm. So, you know, dad, give me the house, I'll just rent it out. That's a retirement plan right there. A couple grand a month on rent. My costs are basically nothing. Pretty good, okay? So that brings us to the end of this lecture. We'll finish up here. Um, there's also, don't forget, there's supplementary materials online, including more help on Prop 13, the budget, the median voter theorem, and lots of other stuff, okay? So go to the module and enjoy it there. All right, see you guys in class on Monday.